Matt Pat could be right, unfortunately. Recently, I've felt the FNAF game theories have been a lot less grounded in actual evidence, but this last video changed everything. For those of you that are new, welcome, I'm Ozone and I'm a pretty big fan of the FNAF books, hot take I know. For such a long time I've been fluctuating between two majorly different ideas until eventually all of it has dampened to the point where I don't really hold an opinion on either side. I find that the fence is the comfiest place to sit. These opposing ideas are now at the core of all FNAF theories these days, whether the recent books are one-to-one -to, -one to the game's timeline, or just reflections of parallelism with each other. And while my aim for this video isn't to convince you of one side of the argument, I actually plan to present both sides of the fence. I'm here not only to compile some of the strongest parallels between the books and the games, but also to show the deniers why other people have a vastly different point of view. And of course, if Matt Pat or anyone around his group of theorists sees this, I'd love to be the one to help them to understand why a portion of the community have the books in their game timelines. Before we begin, please only continue with an open mind and a respect for the opposing side. As somewhat of an influencer on this platform, I'm an advocate of politeness within this community and I hope some of the toxicity from these sorts of topics can be diluted. Thank you. So the best place to begin is probably with the main takeaway I got from the recent Game Theory video. In theory, both Charlie and Afton, in digital form, have a hold on Gregory, and the Ruin DLC will have a lot of aberration regarding the green side, the good, and the purple side, the bad. This is something I absolutely love. The digital creature at the end of the trailer, the Steel Wool logos, even the whole idea that Sun and Moon will become one in the DLC. You see, while in Security Breach we had Vanessa with two identities, a good side, Vanessa, and a bad side, Vanny, I think that Gregory is just completely mentally unstable, irregularly oscillating between his good Charlie side and bad Afton side until eventually he is both at once. He is an eclipse, a combination of light and dark. He has finally fallen into madness. What I believe a lot of the community doesn't like is actually the step-by-step -step process that was taken to get to this level of conclusion. Some people don't like using the books at all, others prefer to think of them as truly canon events in the timeline, but this process feels somewhere in the grey area in between. This is the concept of parallelism, which is a real literary term that is not made up and does not only apply to the Five Nights at Freddy's story. You've all heard the phrase, like father, like son. The similar word structure further helps the reader to understand that the father and the son are alike. They are parallels of each other. So, when you get one higher up of Fazbear Entertainment who wears purple with a name connected to rabbits, and you get another who builds a robot for a dead child who is the little antithesis of the other guy, it's pretty fair to say that they parallel William Henry. Or at least, it's unfair to say that they don't. But then the question about this grey area is, how far can you go? What's the threshold of connection for something to be a parallel? And at what point does a parallel turn into a one-to-one -one event? And perhaps the biggest question, what was Scott Cawthon intending? Because here's the thing, Mr. Burroughs and Edwin Murray very clearly, to me at least, parallel William and Henry respectively. But then you look at the story GGY, where not only do you have a child that looks like Gregory, but one that is called Gregory and shares the same username as GGY. So, is that a parallel? And if it is a parallel, what more confirmation do you need in order to say it's a canon timeline event? That is the big question that I'd like to ask the Game Theorist team coming off of the back of this video. Because as MatPat said, this confirmation that Gregory is patient 46 is one of the clearest pieces of information we've been given in a long time. Gregory in GGY is clearly Gregory. The Pizzaplex in this tale from the Pizzaplex is clearly the same Pizzaplex, fit with its own Fruity Maze arcade game. And the Montgomery Gator that breakdances in GGY is undeniably the Monty we all know and love. What more do you want? This isn't the only story that does this too. All three stories in the Bobby Dot's conclusion have really solid connections to Security Breach's Mega Pizzaplex and the overarching story entails. In the Storyteller, the Baobab Tree is built in the centre of the atrium by a fairy tale castle themed theatre. While neither of these actually exists in Security Breach, 
The strange puppet striped wires that we see everywhere in the pizzaplex are most likely the leftover roots. And a strange little detail pointed out by Enton is that in Princess Quest, we see this strange picture above the main door to the Mimic One Glitchtrap virus. In theory, this is the castle walls of the fairy tale theater. This is the storyteller tree, and inside is the artificial intelligence. I'm not fully convinced, but it's still a neat idea. Along with that, Glamrock Chica is actually yellow in the storyteller. But this Twitter user found that in Security Breach, some of her paint is chipping off, revealing some yellow underneath. But that doesn't even come close to the Bobby Dot stories. Everything in the Pizzaplex lines up. They explain the play structure generators in the daycare. They show DJ Music Man literally doing the same thing he does in Security Breach, and Scott Cawthon altered this story before its full release to make it more accurate to the game's Pizzaplex. Unfortunately, I think that's where I call the checkmate. Three consecutive stories that confirmed things we theorized about but didn't already know, talk about and explore characters from Security Breach, show locations and similar events from Security Breach, and develop the overarching plot of the whole book series. That, to me, is where I draw the line at using parallels, no pun intended. So, if we're truly correct about the nature of these books, there should be two things we can piece together with no issue. Number one, a timeline that spans the life of the Pizzaplex from dawn to destruction, including all of the books and the game. And number two, a full map of the Pizzaplex on its opening days and how it evolves into the one we see in Security Breach. You see, the map is something I've always been curious about because in the books it is told time and time again that the Pizzaplex is circular like a clock or a pizza. You look at Security Breach and that's not a circle. I did end up making a video dedicated to the Pizzaplex map, which was a lot of fun to put together, but since I created that in October of last year, I have had viewers build upon it, creating maps out of my wildest dreams. One of my Discord members, D-Time, created this image which, I'll be honest, is a huge step up. This thing is super professional. You can see that as events in these stories happen, the attractions slowly get shut down. Over the lifetime of the Pizzaplex, the attractions have been replaced and moved multiple times, leading to the glance of the location that we get before it's getting destroyed and ruined. Honestly, kudos to D-Time, I don't think the map is an issue in these books. The thing that I do see being an issue is the timeline. I was talking to ID in a voice chat about this fairly recently, and she had a lot of good points. The main one is an issue with Edwin Murray. He was 24 when he made the Mimic in the early 1980s, and he was 64 when he was killed in the Storyteller Tree. Do the math, and that places the Pizzaplex in the early 2020s. Funnily enough, the explanation that I find the most satisfying here is MatPats, a parallel about Henry building his dead daughter a robot in 1983 that outlives him when he dies 40 years later in 2023. So while we're on the topic, I want to outright tell you that I think the game theorists did an incredible job handling this latest theory. The absolute worst part is that it all works. It's hard to deny that the parallels don't exist. It's hard to deny that green doesn't represent Charlie, and it's hard to deny that it has nothing to do with the ruined DLC. And to add to this video, remember the door that leads into the post-it note room? That is called Charlie door in the files, but also look up. There's three glowing lights that seem to be there for no reason. One yellow, one blue, one pink. Why are there three randomly coloured lights above such an important door? Well, this actually seems to correlate with the three wristbands of the children in the Security Puppet minigame. It's a strange detail, but it's there. And that to me tells me that we're on the right track with using the colour green to associate with Charlie. Charlie being in the Pizzaplex systems makes a lot of sense mainly because of this Nightmarion cult. They look like the Nightmarion entity, they share the same jump scare sound effect, and they have In Your Dreams written on their bodies. Yes, this is Charlie, but how on earth could Charlie get into all of them at the same time? Well, obviously, through the puppet wires all around the Pizzaplex. All of it comes back to Charlie, and all of it explains why she isn't present in the puppet's mask anymore. Symbolically, this theory is near perfection. The reason I think it's so good is because of the completion principle. 
I think that it's much more satisfying to have Charlie be a bigger part of this than to add a whole new roster of characters that have only ever showed up in the books. Andrew existing in the Phasma Frights is the main reason I don't believe those are completely canon. In other words, why would two nearly identical characters coexist when they can just be parallels of each other? So, I think it's your choice. Occam's Razor, the simplest explanation but the loosest, or the other choice which people don't really want but is probably true. Guys, I gotta tell you, I'm lost. Everything in the books is pointing to them being in the games, but the theories presented in these videos are super compelling, and now I'm stuck in my own grey area. This is going to be a pretty long-lasting dilemma, something that will only end if Scott decides to tell us how these books should be used. There's a lot of intricacies and a lot of puzzle pieces that need to be put back together, but at the end of the day, I think anything goes. I believe both sides are completely valid. I don't think either side is perfect, and I don't think either side is completely off track. Overall, I'm just super excited to see how this mimic plot progresses in the new books, and if the FNAF boys are watching this, just know that I really appreciate everything you've contributed, and I cannot wait to see what you will have for us next. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and if you want to hear more about my ideas circling Nightmare on, this video is soon to hit a million views, what? Give it a watch, and I'm sure you will find it fascinating.